A lot of people, including NASA, are getting concerned that the human landing system might not be ready in time for the first crewed return to the moon in over 50 years. But let's not forget, NASA didn't put all its eggs in one basket. They actually awarded contracts to two companies to develop lunar crew landers. So if option A runs into delays, what about option B? Can Blue Origin's Blue Moon Lander replace SpaceX's Starship to the moon? Not long ago, Blue Origin shared an update on X, the first test article assembled and tested in Lunar Plant 1, our lunar transporter SunShield. Designed to be one of the largest deployable shields in space, it will protect both our transporter and Blue Moon Mark II crew lander from radiation while the two vehicles are docked. This SunShield is a 66-foot diameter disc made of multi-layer insulation, and it's built to protect liquid oxygen and hydrogen fuel from solar radiation. On the sun-facing side, it also carries solar arrays capable of generating more than 23 kilowatts of power. Clearly, Blue Origin is steadily making progress on its version of a human landing system, one intended to help return astronauts to the moon. Right now, NASA's plan for the first human return to the lunar surface still centers around SpaceX's Starship, which would be the taxi to carry astronauts to the lunar surface. But there's growing concern that Starship might not be ready in time. To be clear, I'm genuinely impressed by how far SpaceX has come, especially given the rough start earlier this year. Their pace now is relentless, and they're pushing the limits of what's possible. That said, Starship still has a lot to prove before it can safely land humans on the moon. For one, it needs to fly frequently and reliably. It also must demonstrate it can transfer and store massive amounts of cryogenic propellant in space, something that's never been done at this scale. Then, it has to land on the moon, which is no small feat for such a tall vehicle. And after all that, it still needs to launch back off the lunar surface. Arguably, the biggest challenge, though, is the complexity of the mission architecture. To fully fuel a Starship in low Earth orbit for a moon landing and return, SpaceX will need multiple tanker launches. No one knows exactly how many, because they're still refining Starship's payload capacity and haven't yet gathered real-world data on propellant transfer and boil-off, but it's likely to be at least a dozen missions just to make one lunar trip possible. So the question is, if Starship turns out to be too ambitious for this timeline, could Blue Origin's lander become a viable alternative? So first off, what is Blue Origin's human landing system? And what does it actually do? Blue Origin's human landing system, called Blue Moon, is a spacecraft built to carry astronauts from lunar orbit down to the moon's surface, and then back up again. It's more than just a ride, though. While on the moon, Blue Moon will act as a temporary home base, providing life support and shelter as astronauts carry out their scientific work in one of the harshest environments imaginable. For $3.4 billion, NASA has contracted Blue Origin, along with its national team, which includes Lockheed Martin, Boeing, and hundreds of smaller suppliers, to build a lander that will carry astronauts to the moon for the Artemis V mission. This would be the third crewed lunar landing under Artemis, following SpaceX's landings for Artemis III and IV. The contract doesn't just cover the final crewed landing. It also includes the full design and development of the system, plus an uncrewed test mission that's planned to fly about a year before Artemis V. The original plan is that for Artemis V, Blue Origin's Blue Moon Lander would launch on its own and head to lunar orbit. There, it would link up with a cis-lunar transporter, a propellant delivery vehicle developed by Lockheed Martin, which would refuel the lander in space. Once topped off, Blue Moon would dock with NASA's Gateway, a planned small space station that will orbit the moon and serve as a science outpost and crew staging area. Meanwhile, a crew of four astronauts would arrive at Gateway aboard NASA's Orion spacecraft. Two of them would transfer into Blue Moon and descend to the lunar surface. After spending about a week on the moon, the lander would bring them back up to Gateway, where they'd rejoin Orion for the trip home to Earth. As for the design of the lander, 
It has quite a history. When NASA selected three teams, Blue Origin's National Team, SpaceX, and Dynetics, for initial development of a human landing system, Blue's original concept, known as the Integrated Lander Vehicle, ILV, looked very different from what we see today. The ILV was a three-stage lander, with each stage built by a different partner company. It had a transfer stage to push it into lunar orbit, a descent stage with propellant tanks at the bottom, and an ascent stage with the crew cabin on top. Unless it launched on NASA's powerful space launch system, these parts would have needed to go up separately and then be assembled in space. One of the ILV's biggest selling points was its collaborative design. Instead of relying on a single company, the project would have involved hundreds of businesses across the U.S., from major defense contractors to smaller suppliers. That meant the economic impact of NASA's investment would be spread more widely a feature NASA appreciated then and still values today. The ILV also leaned on flight-proven technology. Its transfer stage was based on Northrop Grumman's Cygnus spacecraft, and its ascent stage shared similarities with the Orion crew module built by Lockheed Martin. But NASA was already getting many of those benefits from the SLS, and budget constraints limited how much it could invest in multiple lander concepts. When SpaceX won the sole HLS contract in April 2021, Blue Origin went back to the drawing board, literally flipping the design on its head for a second shot. That second shot paid off. Blue Origin's new lander, Blue Moon, is a very different machine. Standing 16 meters tall, it somehow fits into the 7-meter payload fairing of Blue Origin's own New Glenn rocket, thanks to its compact, modular design. Powered by the BE-7 engine, Blue Moon runs on liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, with the propellant tanks now located at the top of the lander. The larger upper tank holds the hydrogen. At the bottom is the crew cabin, designed to support up to four astronauts and placed low to make entering and exiting the vehicle easier. In a cargo configuration, Blue Moon can deliver up to 20 metric tons to the lunar surface and still return to orbit. If it's left behind, it can carry up to 30 metric tons. The lander is designed for crewed missions lasting up to 30 days. Before that happens, it will undergo an uncrewed demonstration flight, planned for 2027, as part of the Artemis V mission. This test will demonstrate the full HLS system in action, including the lander's life support capabilities, and it's expected to return to the near-rectilinear halo orbit in RHO after departing the moon. The lander is officially called Blue Moon Mark II, but before it ever takes flight, Blue Origin plans to launch a cargo version known as Blue Moon Mark I. Powered by a single BE-7 engine, Mark I is an autonomous lunar lander designed to deliver and support cargo on the moon's surface. It stands 8.05 meters, 26 feet 5 inches tall, 3.08 meters, 10 feet 1 inch in diameter, and has a fueled mass of 21,350 kilograms. It can carry up to 3,000 kilograms of payload, enough to deliver equipment like lunar rovers or even a base station to serve as a power and communications hub for future missions. While Mark I won't carry crew, it plays a critical role in preparing for Mark II. The two landers share key systems, flight computers, avionics, the reaction control system, and power system. So Mark I acts as a kind of full-scale testbed. The data gathered from Mark I's lunar flight will help improve the reliability and performance of the crewed Mark II lander. Just a few days ago, Blue Origin CEO Dave Limp shared a 17-minute video of the BE-7 engine undergoing a long-duration test burn. In the post, he remarked, With rocket engines, boring is good. The test represented the Apogee Rays maneuver burn for the Mark I mission essentially the longest engine burn required to get the lander from Earth orbit to the moon. He points out an interesting detail. The engine in the video didn't have a nozzle. That's because the BE-7 is tested in both vacuum and atmospheric conditions. This particular test was done at GEEX, Blue Origin's atmospheric test site in West Texas. The first Blue Moon Mark I lander is now fully assembled and is moving into final launch preparations. A second Mark I will follow, tasked with delivering NASA's Viper rover to the moon's South Pole in late 2027, where it will search for water ice. As mentioned earlier, these missions also serve a secondary purpose, gathering valuable data to inform the development of the Mark II crewed lander. But there's only so much you can learn from a cargo mission. While Blue Origin's HLS design isn't as futuristic looking as SpaceX's Starship, which could easily pass for a prop from a sci-fi movie, it still requires major technological leaps to get operational. 
One of the biggest challenges is dealing with liquid hydrogen boil-off, a problem that has long haunted rocket engineers. Hydrogen has an extremely low liquefaction point, just a few degrees above absolute zero. In the extreme temperature swings of space, it tends to evaporate quickly, often within a day or two. That's a big issue if your mission requires a lander to sit on the moon for a week or more, which is exactly what Blue Origin is aiming for. Longer stays could be on the table if the company secures future contracts for more ambitious missions. But to make that possible, solving hydrogen boil-off is a top priority, because running out of fuel on the moon with astronauts on board is not an option. Then there's the matter of New Glenn, the heavy lift rocket that will launch the Blue Moon lander. While its debut mission was a success, it still needs to demonstrate the ability to land its booster back on the launch platform, a key step toward full reusability and reducing mission costs in the long term. So, what's the takeaway from all this? Building a human lander for the moon is hard, especially with the level of complexity that NASA's current plans demand. Just look at the fact that both SpaceX's Starship HLS and Blue Origin's Blue Moon HLS require orbital refueling to even make the mission possible. That alone shows how challenging these missions are. No matter which company is building the lander, each faces its own unique set of hurdles. SpaceX is going big with Starship. It's an incredibly ambitious vehicle. In many ways, it's probably overqualified just to return humans to the moon. But if they pull it off, Starship could offer a low-cost, high-capacity way to get to the moon regularly, making a long-term human presence there much more achievable. It's a classic high-risk, high-reward approach. Blue Origin, on the other hand, is more focused on the near-term missions. Blue Moon isn't designed to go to Mars or push the limits of deep space travel. Instead, it's being built specifically for NASA's upcoming Artemis missions, and it's being designed with reliability, reusability, and modularity in mind. Naturally, that leads to a different development pace and strategy. But one thing is clear. Both companies are giving it their all to meet the demands of these high-stakes lunar missions. And regardless of which system flies first or most often, both deserve credit and some cheering for pushing the boundaries of what's possible.